from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good morning and welcome to the Library of Congress. I'm John Cole. I'm the director of the Center for the Book in the Library of Congress, uh, which also has the privilege of being the home of the Young Reader Center at the Library of Congress, which is joining us uh, in uh, sponsoring today's uh, symposium on the reluctant reader. We're very happy to have uh, such a turnout. I want to talk a little bit at the beginning uh, about what we're up to and also how we're going to proceed today. Uh, we're going to uh, have four experts that you're going to hear from and have a chance to question uh, on the aspects of the topic of the reluctant reader. Uh, I will introduce them uh, and they will each make a roughly a five minute statement. Uh, then we'll open it up for questions and we hope to end around 11.30 to have a book signing out in the uh, foyer outside of the uh, Mumford Room where we are today. Uh, I'd like to say a quick word about the Center for the Book and the Young Readers Center. Uh, the center was uh, inspired by Daniel Borston when he was Librarian of Congress way back in 1977 we were created. And the basic idea was to take the Library of Congress and reach out for the first time in a way to the general public on the topics of books and reading, to which we have added, of course, the advocacy of literacy and libraries, and rolled it into a package that also includes the importance of research and scholarship in each of those topics. And we operate primarily through not only programs here at the Library of Congress, uh, including the National Book Festival, for, for which we have a major responsibility, but also, uh, book talks and symposia, and around the country, we are best known for our state affiliates in every state, including Virgin Islands now, and of course the District of Columbia, and our reading promotion partners, which are nonprofit groups in which we share an interest in project development. We are a private public found, uh, not foundation, heavens, if we, only if we were. Uh, <laughs> we are a private public office, uh, but with the Library of Congress supporting our salaries. Uh, we're very proud of a couple of our component units. One uh, is the Young Readers Center, which was created in 2009. And if you haven't had a chance, it's in the Jefferson Building, and we want you to see it. And, I'll be taking some of our, uh, Karen and I, Karen, the uh, director of the Young Reader Center, who I just want to, Karen, stand up and wave. There we go, let's give Karen a hand. <laughs> Karen and I will, uh, after uh, a lunch with our, informal lunch with our speakers, we'll take them over to see that wonderful unit. Another new part of the Library of Congress, but an old part of the, a new part of the Center for the Book, an old part of the Library of Congress, is the uh, Poetry and Literature Center, which now also is in the jurisdiction of uh, the uh, Center for the Book. So we are able to pull together uh, a lot of the interests, uh, literary, literature, literacy, reading promotion, uh, programs for people of all ages, uh, including the Young Reader Center. There are lots of brochures about the basic activities of the Center for the Book across the back, and also, I cannot forget our newest activity, heavens. Uh, we also administer the new Library of Congress Literacy Awards, which are uh, initiated and funded by the local philanthropist, David Rubenstein. So you can see that we have a number of programs that are being pulled together, uh, and we're very pleased to have you part of this particular one. Uh, I, each of the programs that we do uh, is a tape for our webcast. Uh, it will be posted on the Library of Congress website at a later time. So, and also uh, it'll be available on read.gov, which is our, our website. So I'd like you to turn off all things electronic. And I would like to uh, say a little word about the topic and then introduce the speakers. Um, 
we have deliberately, with uh, Karen's insist assistance and the assistance of our speakers, taken an important topic in our area, which is the reluctant reader. Why? What can we do about it? How do we look at it? How have the graphic novels of our time changing these? Uh, are the way we look at them? What are the opportunities? All of these will be addressed in various ways by our speakers. Uh, an article in the Washington Post recently quoted University of Texas professor Andrew Dillon, <coughs> who studies reading, who said, we're spending so much time touching, pushing, linking, scrolling, and jumping through text that when we sit down with a novel or another kind of reading, your daily habits of jumping, clicking, linking are ingrained in you, and you miss a good part of what might be in front of you. And a study recently uh, released by Common Sense Media found that, quote, 30 years ago, only 10%, 8% of 13-year-olds and 9% of 17-year-olds said they hardly ever read for pleasure. And today, the situation is worse. That percentage is it's 22% of the 13-year-olds and 27% of the 17-year-olds that now say that. What exactly is a reluctant reader? Well, we're gonna get a lot of views on that today because we do know there are physiological issues that lead to reading problems, and we'll hear some of that from our panel. Uh, we'll learn about other factors that affect children's attention span, including, of course, their environment, and thus affects their interest in reading. Uh, and today we are taking a special look, as I mentioned earlier, at the role that the graphic novel or illustrated fiction, or sometimes comic books, mm -hmm. uh, have to play in this discussion. Uh, graphic novels are one of the few genre in this uh, publishing field that are having an upward growth trend uh, in the publishing field itself. Uh, and also, we do know that a number of educators have pointed out that the graphic novel genre can help kids understand some fundamentals uh, like how events take place in sequence, how stories are laid out, they can build vocabulary and show that books can be visually appealing. I'm reminded of in the very beginning of the Center for the Book, one of the reasons Dr. Borston created it was to show that the latest technology, which at the time, in 1977, 78, was television. And our very first symposium was television uh, and reading in the classroom and bringing these together. And here we are now examining a new genre uh, and with some of the same perspective and hope, hopefulness, really. And uh, let's see what we can do with graphic novels that we didn't succeed in doing with television, which is another way of thinking about our problem. But let's get started. Uh, our first speaker is going to be Dr. Uh, Trudy Hecker, she's a clinical associate professor of pediatrics at the University of Pens Pennsylvania School of Medicine and the department safety officer for the ambulatory care network and medical director for the international medicine for international medicine at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. She's been a practicing physician for more than 25 years and she is going to bring us a valuable new perspective. Uh, in the fall of 96, uh, the hospital helped launch the Reach Out, Reach Out and Read, a uh, project we know about uh, at the Library of Congress, and I think you probably know about it too. It's a nat national pediatric literacy program that today comprises more than 5,000 primary care sites throughout the country, and Reach Out and Read, uh, in which uh, Trudy had a fundamental role in starting this organization, actually was the first winner of the Library of Congress David Rubenstein Literacy Award last year. So we're very proud uh, to have them here. And it also indicates something we have in mind in developing the program. As we gradually develop winners for the Library of Congress Literacy Awards, and uh, develop a best practices kind of recognition. We're going to be bringing more groups into uh, this network and have more capability and resources for sharing ideas, which is what the Center for the Book is all about. But right now, uh, Trudy 
Heckler is what we're all about, and we look forward to hearing what she has to say about the reluctant leader. Reader, Trudy? Thank you so much. It's really an honor to be here. Um, you, you all in the audience are really experts about reading and speech language development. I am a pediatrician that sees patients on a regular basis, and um, I'm a mother of two boys, one who was an avid reader and one who was a very reluctant reader. And I can tell you I learned from first-hand experience, and that's sort of what led us to reach out and read as an, a model for primary care physicians to be part of. You say to yourself, what does a physician have to do with reading? Well, we see kids all the time. At two weeks, two months, four months, six months, we are in a very honorable position with our families. The families trust us, I hope, and we have a partnership. I think the parents and ourselves are in partnership to raise those children, and so to have the opportunity to talk about the importance of reading and to do that in the context of well child care has been an honor for me to do over the last uh, 17 years at CHOP. We've been uh, having that program for that long. Um, you know, it spans the, the age ranges of the two-year-old that's coming in. We talk about the two-year-old that's very busy, motorly driven, and is, we talk about what we call almost drive-by reading, where you're sort of engaging the mother in what that attention span is for that child, to the six-year-old who's starting school and who's struggling with reading, to the 12-year-old who thinks it's too cool to be reading um, and having a little tr trouble perhaps in school as well. Um, we really want to look at the medical model, so my approach is to look at that medical model to really get a good history of what's going on in that child's world. What's happening in school? Is it attention? Is it reading? Is, it, is our behavior components as part of that as well? Is the child hearing well? Is the child seeing well? We have to think of all those aspects of the medical care. What's going on with the child's medical illness? Do they have a chronic disease state? You know, if they're on asthma, are they getting albuterol? Is that making them hyper, not being able to attend? Um, if they have other underlying diseases, what about their past medical history? We know that we have an explosion of premature infants being born. We know now that that data suggests that those children, in fact, do have attentional problems and will often have learning difficulties later in school. I, have, uh, I saw a 24-week premature infant last week that has, was one pound, one ounce came to my office at four months of age. So we really have to be prepared for managing those children's learning issues and to get them prepared for you to be the recipients of educating them and managing their care um, through the school systems as well. Certainly family history is crucial to this. We know that about 15% of kids will have a reading problem and so family history is a big part of that for attention disorders as well as um, reading disorders and learning problems in general. And then a very good idea of what the social situation is going on we really have to ask, I work in inner city Philadelphia, so who's in the home? What's happening in the home? Is English the first language? Um, is there a, a change in the school setting, a change in the home itself, the siblings, the parents? What's going on there? And then I also try to really spend a fair amount of time on what is the parent's approach to, to technology to sort of build off of what John said. You know, where's the TV? How many TVs do we have? How many hours is it on, and is it in the child's bedroom? I can tell you I've been asking for the last two years of the patients that I see, and almost to a person, they have a TV in the child's bedroom. These are two-year-olds, three-year-olds, five-year-olds, eight-year-olds. Think about what that does for attention span. Think about what that does for sleep habits, for um, what they're seeing at two in the morning when everyone else is asleep. And the background noise, about 30% of families have TV on almost consistently. I take call still. I was on call last night. Parent called me, the TV is on, it's two in the morning. What is that about? So I think really that issue of TV and technology, also when I walk into the exam room, there's a phone there and it's being used for games. And what does that mean? So we really have an opportunity to think differently about how we approach technology. Then looking at the developmental assessment, and that's where Reach Out and Read comes in. And then a good physical exam is also important, making sure there aren't dysmorphisms or genetic syndromes. Back, you know, 25 years ago, 30 years ago, almost now I've been a pediatrician that long, Fragile X was something we barely knew about. Now we know a lot about Fragile X. We know a lot about attention deficit disorder. We know a lot about these things and the genetic predispositions to them. So making sure that you think about that when you assess the child and making sure what labs we need to be thinking about. Nutrition is crucial to brain development, so we want to make sure the child's not anemic. We want to make sure the child's not lead poisoned. Here in Washington, here in Baltimore, in, in Philadelphia, with huge problems with lead poisoning. That changes attention, that changes the ability to learn to read and to learn to function in school settings. So we want to make sure we're screening for that as well. And then working with our colleagues and referring, talking to the schools, making sure we refer to our college, colleagues as well to make sure we understand how we can move forward. As a pediatrician, my issue is prevention, as you can tell, and preventing. And so immunizations is what I sort of give for a living. But the other piece to this is really picking up on Reach Out and Read. So I wanted to spend 30 seconds on Reach Out and Read as a model 
We are now, as uh, John said, in 5,000 offices across the country. Six million children served each year. What I do as a pediatrician is go in to see the child at six months and take one of these books, age-appropriate books, and that book becomes my tool to model for the parents, becomes my teachable moment. When I go in and see a six-month-old, and that baby sitting on a teen mom's lap, and that mother has no idea what mother ease is and how to speak to that baby, I can model for that. I can go in the book, and that baby's eyes light up. I show this book, the baby's patting the book, putting it in his mouth, and I can give that mother permission for oral motor development, because we know that's so crucial to later development. And so the ab ability to give a book, and in the context of advice, is really a crucial thing that we can do in our offices and model. And I hope that I have what we call as a bully pulpit, and I don't mean it that way. I know that's a very sensitive term, but I hope I'm a trusted advisor to the family, and that can make a difference for that family to go home. And we know that research now shows that children who are given books are read to four times more often and are, have the ability to begin to have earlier speech language development. So it's very crucial for brain. So brain development is crucial to what we do. Uh, the neurons are burgeoning in the first three years of life. I've got about three years to keep that nutrition going and stimulate that brain. And books have to be part of that conversation so that there's that dialogic um, reading that's going along as well as the interaction, what we call now serve and uh, respond. And so that the mother is being taught to talk to the baby, allowed to really have that interaction to model I get to do that. I'm lucky. I get to do that every day when I see babies and really model that for the parents so they are given permission to be able to interact with that child on a regular basis. And then the last part of our, environment, our uh, program is the environment where we give out gently used books. So every baby from six months to five years gets a new book. And then every child that comes in for a sick visit or a sibling that's coming along or over the age of six gets a gently used book. So that many of the books that you all have in your libraries, we get donated. And so at CHOP alone, we have given out about 600,000 600, books in the last 10 years to children in West Philadelphia and South Philadelphia. That's how important we think this is for brain growth, for stress reduction. Toxic stress is the other topic that's out there. We know that early intervention and one-on-one -on -one parent modeling makes a huge difference later for children to protect them against that stress. What we're finding now is that that's actually um, genetically predisposed, and so mothers who are delivering babies who have been stressed are now delivering babies that are not functioning as well either. So we have to do everything we can to reduce that toxic stress and then look at language development because that's the best predictor of later outcome and improve school readiness. So with that, I probably should stop. <laughs> We've been talking too long. Let's thank Trudy for that opening statement. Lots, lots to talk about right there, but now uh, I'm going to introduce Dr. Claire Agard. Uh, Claire is a national certified school psychologist who holds certifications in the District of Columbia and Maryland. She's been a school psychologist for Prince George's County Public Schools for 24 years. Her course of study included neuro neurologic, neurogenic sorry, uh, language disorders, memory and learning, and neurophysiology in school settings, including identifying educational disabilities and intervention and behavior management. Uh, I might say that at the, on the news release that's at the back table, we have slightly fuller biographies of our distinguished panel, but for now, I'd like to present Claire Agard. Claire? Thank you. <clears throat> Uh, I was asked to address the social and emotional problems that typically accompany reading difficulties. Um, our topic is the reluctant reader, and I found that typically when students are reluctant to read, it's because like anyone, they avoid something that they find difficult. And most often, these children do go on to um, being identified as having a learning disability. Um, some of the reasons that you see children developing social emotional difficulties are because they become frustrated at the continued failure through, throughout their academic years. And there's an estimation that at least 75% of students with reading difficulties develop social, emotional, or behavior problems. Um, sometimes they're constantly being prompted by teachers and parents to do better. Uh, adjectives are like lazy are being used to um, describe them. And the child is already doing the best he or she can. And, but we fail to realize that. Um, 
they typically are rejected by peers. Uh, they have difficulty, some of them have difficulty reading social cues and often difficulty with oral language. The oral language difficulties become much more of a disadvantage during adolescent years when that becomes very, very important in social interaction. So those kids are even more likely to be rejected as they become adolescents. Um, in terms of emotional symptoms, anxiety is probably the one most typically seen. And um, this can be manifested in a variety of ways. Children complaining of tummy aches, stomach aches, trying to avoid school, headaches. Sometimes the pattern is such that you only hear those complaints Monday through Friday, and other times you hear them throughout, you know, throughout the school year. Um, and then when the stress is released, uh, relieved during the summer, spring vacation, there are no physical problems. Right now, I'm working with a high school student who has been hospitalized probably for about a total of 45 days within the last four months. And she's been complaining of abdominal pain and nothing can be found, nothing physiological is being found so far. Um, and psychologists at Children's Hospital have now referred her for therapy because they're thinking it's anxiety resulting from academic difficulties. As it turns out, this student does have a learning disability and is receiving special education. We're not sure that that's the origin of the problem, but it could be, and there's a very good chance that it is. Um, some of these children, the anxiety is expressed through clowning around in class. That way, they receive attention from peers and it's not necessarily negative because they're entertaining the class. At the same time, they're avoiding doing something that's anxiety provoking. So the clowning around helps them to relieve their anxiety. Um, see what? These, the children with anxiety often is generalized outside the school setting and they may have difficulty entering new situations or anything that involves a transition may become anxiety provoking for, for them. So the anxiety isn't just confined to the school setting, just it's typically generalized outside. And in such cases, these children may go on to being identified as having an additional disability um, on top of being learning disabled. Depending on how the anxiety is affecting academic performance, there's a likelihood that they could be classified with an emotional disorder um, if it's significantly impact, impacting academic achievement. And ways in which we sometimes see the anxiety impacting academic achievement is through school phobias, one of the ways you see them, or students cutting classes and roaming the hallways, and we're thinking they're just being difficult. And it's not that they're just being difficult, they're just trying to avoid an anxiety-provoking situation. In terms of depression, children with reading difficulties tend to report depressed mood at a significantly higher rate than other students do. Um, unfortunately, adults, not because they don't care, but just because they don't know, they often miss depression in kids or adolescents, and that's because it typically presents differently from the way it presents in adults. Often in children and adolescents, um, depression presents as irritability, and they attempt to be, they, they come across as being bad-tempered. Um, some studies have suggested that there is a difference between the way girls express their depression and the way boys express their depression. And it seems to be related to the way we've been socialized. Boys um, typically don't show, aren't supposed to be, they're supposed to be men and not show emotion. So they, they're more likely to exhibit the aggressive kinds of behavior. Where girls, you're more, tend to see the depression being um, manifested through withdrawal and those kinds of things. Um, 
The children and adolescents, in, a, in addition to the irritability, short-tempered behavior, they do exhibit the symptoms that adults uh, exhibit. And probably problems with sleep, either getting to sleep when they get to bed, they may lie awake for hours, or early morning awakening, three, four o'clock, and not being able to get back to sleep, changes in appetite. Um, most people think that you lose appetite when you're depressed. But there is a group of individuals who tend to overeat when they're depressed, so it can be manifested either way. Um, loss of interest in things they had previously found interesting, exciting. Um, those are some of the, the ways you see depression being ex expressed in children. Um, there's, there are studies that show that Amongst students who are having difficulty reading, there's a higher percentage of delinquency. And I read someplace that in, among the prison population, when they're surveyed, that more than 50% report having experienced difficulty reading while at school. And some years ago, it was reported, I think it was Texas, that was using um, grade level reading ability to project their prison population 10 years advance because they found that there's such a close relationship between reading ability and delinquency. Um, these children have poor self-image, as you would expect. They use a lot of negative statements to describe themselves. They feel as though they have no control over their future. There's no relationship between their effort and outcomes. And um, they often tend to see the environment as a whole as being negative and sometimes threatening. There is even impact in the family because reading disabilities, there is, it's, typically, it's genetic. Um, about 50% of the heritability is genetic, and the rest of it comes from the environment. So more often than not, there is a parent that has had reading difficulties too. And these parents sometimes cope in one of two ways, either by ignoring the fact that it's really a disability and may constantly be on the child to try harder. Or in other ways, they relive their frustration through the child, and it causes their parenting skills to suffer. Um, am I over time? Karen had asked me to mention how we go about identifying children in the school system with a reading disability. And it's typically a test battery. But prior to that, we get a referral. And uh, the referral looks at the kinds of things that are being seen in class, the interventions that have been tried, what has been successful, what has not. The test battery consists of uh, the IQ test and academic tests and, and tests of what, what's called information processing, like auditory processing, visual processing, those kinds of things. And it's because the, the um, definition of a learning disability includes a disorder of the psychological processes, such as memory, phonological awareness, and those kinds of things. Once a student is identified, they receive special education services. And now that the movement, there's a move toward inclusion, this is provided in the classroom, typically. The special ed teacher goes into the classroom with the regular education teacher. Children with more serious disabilities may be in what in our system we call them the uh, intensive resource classes, and those are classes with a small teacher-student ratio. And I think I'll stop there. All right. Well, thank you very much, Claire. <coughs> but I tell you, a whole other perspective to chew on. Uh, our next speaker uh, is Jared Kroshaska, who has been passionate about storytelling through words and pictures since he was a kid. He began his professional career by illustrating educational readers for a national publisher while he was still an undergraduate at the Rhode Island School of Design. He is the author and illustrator of 10 Lunch Lady graphic novels, 
which are published by Random House, as well as the Platypus Police Squad middle grade novels and numerous other picture books. And he is a two-time winner of the Children's Choice Book Award, which is sponsored by the Children's Book Council, another partner of ours. I'm pleased to present Jared. Jared? Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, so as an author and illustrator uh, for children's books, uh, from the very beginning of, of, of my career, people would always ask me what my favorite book was to read as a kid. And I'd always go back to just these, these three books, which are, are very near and dear to my heart. And I, I still have my childhood copies on my bookshelf in my studio. And, and those books are The Mouse and the Motorcycle by Beverly Cleary, and James and the Giant Peach by Roald Dahl, and Bonicula by James Howe. <laughs> and, and I would always go back to just these three books. Uh, even after the Lunch Lady graphic novels had, had gained in popularity, I would only go back to those three books. Like, what did you like to read? Well, from when I was a kid, that was the only thing that was really, that really qualified as, as reading. But on, upon further inspection of my uh, bookshelf in my art studio, you'll find old Garfield treasuries and, and Snoopy treasuries and Calvin and Hobbes treasuries. And, and collections of, of Batman graphic novels. And I realized that I was reading, you know, I read so many comics as a kid, but that wasn't validated as reading for me. And I could only imagine how much more confident I would have grown as a reader if that were the case. I mean, every day I would, I, my grandfather would come home from work in the evening and I would grab the newspaper and I would go straight to the comic strip section. And, and I would go, go down to my favorites. And, and for about a year and a half, I, know I, I was trying to save money, so I would make my own Garfield treasuries by cutting it out every day and placing mm -hmm. it in a photo album. Mm -hmm. And if I couldn't get a ride to the comic book store, I would walk. And it was a mile and a half from my house. And, and, and I feel like this is a story for my grandkids, but I would, I would walk three miles just to learn what happened to Batman and Superman and Spider-Man and the X-Men. And so when I, when I reflect on that, I thought, I, I was willing to walk three miles to read, but that wasn't validated as reading to me when I was a kid. So I feel uh, so very happy for the, the young students today who have educators who are championing, championing graphic novels and, and allowing uh, books like Lunch Lady and Baby Mouse to exist in their school libraries and to be handed out, and, and to those, especially to those librarians who, who still have to educate uh, some of the classroom teachers who might say, or parents who might say, you know, only allow our, our kids to check out real books. I was at a, a, visiting a school in, in Houston, and this librarian shared the story where a parent came in and said, you know, don't let my child check out the Garfield treasures anymore. I, I just real books. And uh, she put on her brave face, and she, she looked at the mom, and she said, you know, when you take your child to uh, the playground, do you say to your child, like, you need to get up on those monkey bars, and you have to be on those monkey bars for 20 minutes a day, and if you can't do the monkey bars, then you, you don't know how to play. That's, you know, you, know you, you allow your child to find the playground equipment that they most feel comfortable with. So maybe they're going on the slide, maybe they're going on the seesaw, and eventually they'll get up on the monkey bars. Because what I've, what I've seen over the years in educators who have, have used uh, lunch lady, and I should say, it, it is something that totally took me off guard. I mean, I really, my, my only motivation was to draw a lunch lady fighting off evil robots with fish sticks. Like, let me just put that out there. <laughs> like, that, that was my goal in life. Uh, but, but, you know, life, life had a, a different path for, for lunch lady and me. And so, uh, if we can't, like, just expect our kids to, to come to us and where we need them to be. Like, we have to meet them where we are, right? And so, so what kind of tools can we use to, to meet them where they are? Books that are of very high interest but low readability are, are, are just such a great way to, to hook those kids in. And, and whatever, whatever it takes, you know, a nonfiction book about dinosaurs or, or a, a goofy, strange, little, funny, weird comic. Um, and as a parent now, I have, I have two daughters at home. Uh, Zoe is five and Lucy is two. And... My wife, Gina, and I learned pretty quickly when we were getting that baby room ready for that first kid that it would actually be more important for us to spend our time filling that room with books mm -hmm. than it was getting the, the changing table. Right? The baby comes, you run to, run, run to the store and get some diapers. 
you know. Uh, and, and that's something that we really try to, to educate the people in our lives, that you just need to read to that kid from day one, and day two, and day three, and day four. And, and we had a, a friend of ours who, who told us, you know, her, her child was 10 months at the time, and she said, I read a book to him for the first time. And, you know, he didn't really get it. So we're going to put the books away. Right. Exactly. And when he can understand the story. Yeah. Oh. We'll, exactly. we'll, and I thought, you, this child is going to spend the rest of his life catching up. Yes. That's exactly and, right. and it's not about understanding the story. You know, uh, day one, we read Goodnight Moon, and I got through halfway through the story. And it wasn't because she, she found it dull and derivative. You know, <laughs> she was upset about her stomach or something. I don't know. But, you know, what our children learned is that, uh, reading is something we do together, and it's an act of love, and, it, and it's the parents are showing you, the child, that we love you so much that we're going to spend this time with you, and we're going to read the story together. And when it was safe to leave books in uh, the crib, or any object, uh, 10 months, we would leave a little board book. And we could see on the video monitor our daughter just turning the pages and, and mouthing words, and she was understanding that this is the process. Now, when she was about three, you know, she would choose a different book every night, and she would sleep with a couple of books. And, and one night, as I was turning up the light, Zoe said, she got really sad. She says, but Daddy, I can't read the words. Mm -hmm. And I thought, oh, this is a make or break moment for me as a dad. <laughs> like, <laughs> don't mess this up, Krasaska. <laughs> and I just sat on the edge of her bed, and I said, but you can read the pictures. Yeah. And, and that, is, that is real reading, too. And, and this confidence grew back in her face. And we made sure we had wordless picture books and, and she's five and a half. She'd like to point out if she was here, she'd say five and a half. Uh, <laughs> she's reading the pictures all the time and now is starting to read some words. So thank you. Great. Well, thank you, thank you, Jared. Uh, Stefan Pastis is the, the creator of the Pearls Before Swine comic strip and also the Tommy Failure series published by Candlewick of books for young readers. Uh, he took an unusual route to becoming the number one best-selling comics creator that he is. He went to law school. <laughs> As a child, he spent many hours drawing and contributed cartoons for his school newspaper, but by the time he graduated from UC Berkeley, uh, he didn't expect that his avocation could give him a career. His Timmy Failure series is published in 40 languages worldwide, and this summer, the ALA, the American Library Association, selected Timmy Failure for its national summer reading poster. Stefan. Thank you. <laughs> <clears throat> well, yeah, thank you very much. Like um, he was just saying, I, I really came, um, I think I learned how to read um, when I was a little kid because my aunt had this um, shelf load of Charles Schultz's uh, Peanuts books. And I thought they were so great. And I wanted to learn how to read so I could read them. Um, so from the very get-go, my attachment to reading was through comic strips. Um, in fact, it inspired me so much that even as a little kid, I knew when I grew up, I wanted to do what Charles Schultz did. Now, I took a little detour um, and became a lawyer for 10 years. Uh, those are the 10 lost years of my life. <laughs> um, but um, eventually my dream came true and I got to be a syndicated cartoonist. Um, so Pearls launched in newspapers in 2002 and I've done it for about 12 years. Um, now a few years ago I was approached by a children's book agent who was a fan of the strip and he asked me if I wanted to do an um, illustrated novel for middle graders sort of like Diary of a Wimpy Kid. Um, and it sounded like um, sort of an extension of what I do naturally, which is combining drawing with um, art. And I thought, uh, yeah, I would take a shot at it. So I, I came up with this Timmy Failure uh, character. Um, Timmy is a little detective who can take any mystery and make it more mysterious. <laughs> and he's not a very smart little boy. He can't solve anything. Um, but it's been a lot of fun for me. So. One of the things I get to do uh, in both roles as a comic strip creator and the creator of Timmy is to um, reach these kids. Um, like Schultz reached me when I was a little kid. And it's interesting, the way I do it um, is sort of odd. 
Um, I don't write sort of to the kids. I don't write down to the kids. I write to make myself laugh. Um, and when I do that, it seems like I reach 11-year-old kids. <laughs> <laughs> so apparently, even though I'm 46, I'm 11. Um, but it's great. I, I enjoy it, and I get to see what they like. You know, when you do a comic strip, you have a huge advantage, because if you do a book, say you put out a book a year, and then after the year is up, you get some feedback. I get feedback on what kids like every single day. And I know, after 12 years of doing it, I know what they respond to. So when I went to write the book, I knew I could fill it with those sorts of things to keep them engaged. Um, I'm also conscious that when I was their age, um, it sounds like I had a lot of the problems that you all described. <laughs> um, I was always bored in class, constantly bored in class. So I used to sit in the back of all of my classrooms and I would draw the entire class. Because if you sit in the back of the class and you draw the entire class, it looks like you're just the best note taker ever. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but that's, you know, that's what I would do. So I'm conscious when I write to these kids of how easily I was bored, how quickly I was distracted. Mm -hmm. So I try to make Timmy um, lively, quick paced, not too dense, um, and to keep them engaged. It's a, it's a real challenge. So, but anyways, I enjoy it. So thank you very much. Thanks, Stefan. We have so many talented people here on the panel. I'd like to open the question session by asking any of the panelists if they have any questions for any of the other panelists. Well, I like Stefan. I, I really did feel like Claire was just like changing the names to like, <laughs> to, like respect our privacy. Like, I feel like I just learned a lot about who I was in high school right. from that. Um, so, um, how, how could we as authors or, or, or educators in the room, um, like how could we get some of the resources you shared or like how, how could we help you guys do what, what you're doing in terms of um, reaching those kids who are, are maybe having the emotional problems because they're not psyched about reading? Um, I think most of it starts at home. And I think not only parents, but teachers too. They need to learn to praise children for their effort Mm. and not for the grade, not just for the product. Um, the, one of the other things I tell parents that I work with is that you find something that the child is good at. If it's an extracurricular activity, another academic subject, something. Something where they're experiencing success so that all the focus isn't on you know, the weakness. Yeah. Um, and I think that's something that kind of cuts across. The parents have to do that, but I think teacher, classroom teachers need to do that too. And one of the things I meant to mention, um, but forgot to, I work in a school district where we have a huge percentage of bilingual students. I don't know what the percentage is. My supervisor is here. Maybe she can say it. Okay, and um, let me back up. I'm the parent of a son who started attending a bilingual school from age two and a half. And then from age four, right through to the end of eighth grade, he was in an all French school. So I quickly learned is that, you know, reading is a process, because he never learned to read English until the fourth grade. And I remember the first book he read, and he's still keeping it, was the very first Harry Potter book. Somebody gave it to him as a birthday gift. And I tell, watching him do it um, has caused me to say to my parents, reading is a process. To the Spanish-speaking parents, if you can't read English, read to them in Span Spanish. It's still reading. Eventually, they make the transition from one language to the other. And it's actually true. Reading in one language doesn't hamper reading development in another. And I think that's something we need to get across to both teachers and parents. Because there are actually teachers out there who sometimes discourage reading in the language other than English, when indeed it actually helps. Um, studies have shown that children who are bilingual tend to do better on lots of academic um, standardized tests as well as throughout the school year. So that's something I thought was important to mention. Trudy, do you want to respond to Jared? Uh, 
Sure. I, uh, first, I want to respond to um, uh, Claire, because I think uh, the other issue is the literacy level of the parent and understanding what the literacy level of the parent is. And when we give books out and we have parents take books, it's really about telling the story. Um, you know, the NALS one, we have 20% of the population that, you know, can't read a bus schedule, and maybe it's even higher than that now. So we really have to keep that in mind as we're seeing kids in the context of the visit. So we really talk about sharing a book, not necessarily reading a book. They can talk about stories. They can bring things from their culture. So I, I agree with you wholeheartedly. Many parents ask me about second language issues, and absolutely, you want to keep talking fluently to them in all the languages that, that live in that household, and it's not a problem. And actually, it does improve brain growth. So I think that's a terrific thing. We would we love your books <laughs> when oh, the you. kids so the, when the kids come in and get you know the, again we're birth to six to five really books so your books are a wonderful treat when they come in as gently used books for our patients oh, and they you. love it and I think you know you're on the right track that whole issue of sort of engaging with the child talking about that discovery really sort of mixing the um, you know sort of the graphics with the um, language is really what we want to engage our kids I have. Two patients, one you know that are now 18 years old. I tells you how long I've been a pediatrician. They were 28-week twins. One was um, very sick, had G-tube feedings. And for those of you who know what that is, severe feeding disorder, which goes along with speech language issues. So you really have to keep that in mind. And the other was just did perfectly and was you know my, the avid reader. And actually getting those kinds of graphic novels now that they're 18, seeing some of the books that you've written and others have written really helped her. She actually was able to find a source for her life. She, she's going to culinary school. She got into a magnet program for culinary school. And it was because the recipes, the concept of sort of that kind of sort of mixing of, um, you know, sort of reading abilities is really what made her life more useful and more helpful. So I think, you know, I would say just keep on going. And maybe we can think about, I mean, one thing for Reach Out and Read that's an issue is we, we're really trying to create a love of reading and a love of books so that we avoid that reluctant reader later. Um, we can't do that, obviously, that goes without saying, but, you know, sometimes I think uh, authors that could give us a bit more of a message about struggling um, with some of these messages would be very helpful for kids. Cool. So, uh, I have another question for Trudy, too, sure. um, and thank you for that. I, so a big concern of, of uh, my wife's and, and mine is that, you know, a big part of also raising a reader is not just reading them to them all the time, but but having them see you read for pleasure, yes, absolutely. you know, and we find ourselves, okay, we need to take this little device where we're on like Facebook and Twitter and reading the news yes. and like hide it. Cause I feel like they're, they're catching us using that all instead of having like a physical book, yeah. you know? And um, are, there, are there studies being done? Is there something that's being to address that? Because yes. I mean, we're conscious of that, but I'm, I can't I'm, imagine everyone is. Everyone is, and, I, and we probably have more experts in the room mm -hmm. than here, but uh, the people at Temple in Philadelphia, can, Kathy Hearst Passage and the University of Delaware are really beginning to do some of those studies, and we know that that's going to be a very cons big concern for us, that attention span, the graphics moving. The Einstein, baby Einstein actually was pulled from, you know, there was a lawsuit because of that, because there's nothing there. Good. You're just watching fish go across the screen. Good. What good is that? Good. I mean, nothing. Yeah. I mean, really. And so the whole issue is the AAP actually has standards. You can go to the AAP website on uh, guidelines for media use and for um, and we recommend no electronic devices before the age of two. <coughs> I'm going to tell you that's not always easy. Yeah. And less than one hour of TV a day. I mean, the average two-year-old, eight hours. It's ridiculous. I mean, it's unbelievable what we're seeing. So I agree with you totally. There are studies yeah. that are being done. We just don't have the data. But intuitively, I can tell you that it's, it's, it's not good for attention. It's not interactive. We know the neurons are stimulated. There's genetics, and there's also the interaction. So talking yeah. to your daughter, reading to her, yeah. spending time drawing, spending time with her, and, and doing that dialogic back and forth, that's what's going to make that brain really yeah. ready, you know? And, and, and even just sitting quietly next to them if they have their book, yes. and you have, so they can actually see exactly. you reading. Exactly. You and know? that's, you know, for the inner city families that we serve, mm -hmm. that's a big issue. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. we did a study about 10 years ago, and there were less than 20 books in the home, and we had to reach out and read mm -hmm. 10 years already. I have 10 books on my nightstand. That, it's, uh, it's unfathomable. You make home visits, families just don't have books. That includes the books we give them. So there's really just not that culture. And now there's also the, you know, we, we're very careful because the other issue is making sure they're ready for school. You see that, you know, learning your letters, learning your numbers, learning your colors. Well, that's important, but that's not really the point. You know, it's not about that rote learning. It's more about the dialogue and what, and the richness of the experience and asking the kids questions about that. You know, and that the economics are phenomenal. I mean, has, has anybody heard of the 30 Million Word Project? 
If you haven't Googled that, you must. It's in the University of Chicago. It's amazing teaching inner city families about how much a difference stimulating the language early on, getting kids loving books, reading, makes a difference. Uh, you know, the number of words you're exposed to if you're in a middle class family is two to three times the number of words that you're exposed to if you're in an, an impoverished setting. So it's really a huge issue yeah. for us. And I feel, feel like those little blackberries and crackberries are going to be <laughs> yeah. making things worse. You know, one of the things I've seen some of our elementary school teachers do for parents who are not very literate, they have lent the family's books with, they used to be books on tape, but I guess now they're CDs on tape. So the child can listen to it while following along in the book. And those have been known to students who have a disability and just to other students who are, you know, learning English. And those are pretty helpful in those situations. So that's something that can be done. Any other questions from the panel? Let's go to the audience. Can anyone, uh, and please identify yourself and we'll bring a microphone around before you lay it on us, okay? We <laughs> <laughs> Gotta get some water before we yeah. start here. No, <laughs> that's the key. My name is Kathleen Bodie. I am a fifth grade teacher with Fairfax County Elementary Schools. Um, I am wondering if Dr. Agard, is that how you? Agard. Agard. If you wouldn't mind just cr going across the street to the Capitol and telling them your quote, praise the kids for effort, not for product. <laughs> Seriously, because I feel I will. like I want to reach these kids where they are, yeah. and I have to, but in the same sense, I have to be give them rigorous text so they're ready for, mm -hmm. in Virginia, we have the SOLs, yeah. you know, that state. <laughs> Um, testing and if I meet them where they are, which is what I do when I meet with my small groups, they're not ready for the text that comes to them. Exactly. So it is, it, it's a battle. And then of course we're looked at as a teacher and as a school and as a district, how our test scores are. And that's how we are identified is by our test scores and it's not really looking at how hard these kids are trying mm -hmm. coming from I mean, you know, being from PG County, but also in Fairfax County, you know, we have a whole corridor where it's just poverty stricken and we get those kids and they don't know their letters coming yeah. into kindergarten. Yeah. And in fifth grade, they're still reading on a second grade reading level. So how can we, how can we reach those kids where they are and still feel like we are producing the way that the county or the state, you know, the data that they want to see? Does that make sense? Yeah, I, I don't know if it's possible to do this, but <laughs> you know, I, I think it would be great if all teachers, particularly el elementary school teachers, can set aside probably 10 or 15 minutes at the end of the school day where every child is given a book, chooses a book at his or her reading level or is help to choose an appropriate book, and they can just spend that time reading. Years ago, we used to have something in the county called Drop Something and Read. I don't remember. <laughs> I don't remember what it was. But I haven't seen that around, but I think it would be something that would be good, a non-pressuring time, where children can choose things of high interest, whether it's a sports illustrated magazine or a comic book or whatever it is. And there's no pressure. Um, if they ask for help, they're given it. You know, if they're just using context clues, the pictures to read, that's fine, whatever. Um, that's one thing I think would be good. Did you say the state test was SOL? Yeah. That is a terribly <laughs> ironic Standard acronym. Of learning. Standard of learning. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> You know, one of the, Trudy mentioned risk, risk factors, medical risk factors. One of the things that I tend to look at when I get a referral for testing, I, you know, I try to get as much of the medical history as I can. But sometimes I get students and the parents, you ask about the environmental allergies, and the parents would say yes. Uh, oh, he's ha he has that all year long. And it's never being treated. And sometimes these children who are congested a lot, they miss out on a lot of language. And I think one of the things that we somehow need to get parents to understand, yes, environmental allergies aren't 
gonna cause your child to peel over and die, but you know, they need to be treated because they can negatively impact both oral language, reading skills, spelling, all of that. And, and that's something we sometimes overlook. Right, and I think hearing. I mean, you know, clearly yeah, that, yeah. you know, if you've got allergies, your ears are gonna be clogged right, all the exactly. time. So you're gonna have auditory processing exactly. issues as well. So yeah. yeah, I think that's very true, no question about it. Yeah. And, and a lot of kids with allergies have mid-face hypoplasia, so their yeah. ability to do oral motor functioning is very yeah. difficult. And they yeah. often have feeding disorders as well. We often see failure to thrive for kids who have snoring. I mean, that's the other epidemic we're beginning to see is snoring. I ask my patients about snoring. It's amazing how many kids have snoring. And what we used to think tonsils and you know, adenoids was kind of silly, but actually we're seeing a lot of kids that really actually do need their tonsils and adenoids removed. They breathe much better, they feel much better, they're much more alert, in mm -hmm. addition to having ability to manage their airway and also mm -hmm. eat better. I mean, they, you know, the child's failing to thrive. You have to think about that in your mm -hmm. differential. I've been thinking a little bit about how kids feel about themselves. I mean, some of the speakers have talked about it. And yesterday we were lucky enough in the, in the Young Reader Center to have uh, Stefan talk about his books uh, and his career in a, a wonderful presentation, but we never did talk about, at least when I was around, uh, the word failure and how you came up with mm -hmm. the word failure for the Timmy books and your, your thinking behind that. And I'm Well, I come ahead from, I mean, I just do a, sort of a, a, I have a comic strip mentality, so I'm always just looking to make myself laugh. And Timmy is such a, a cute, sweet, name and failure is such a blunt harsh word so the the two of them together timmy failure just made me laugh but um <laughs> oh you 11 year olds <laughs> yeah but you know it's funny like when you want to get a kid's attention you sort of i learned this from the comic strip you sort of have to hover on that line of appropriate inappropriate i mean you really engage them when you're there so you know timmy has a best friend who's a little overweight whose name is Rolo Tukas. <laughs> and um, yeah, you know, I mean, I use, the word, I use the word stupid a lot. I use the word dumb. And I know some of it's not appropriate, but um, kids love it. I mean, they really, they don't talk like you do. I mean, they, they talk like, you know, their friends talk. So um, I can feel it. Like yesterday when we did the talk in the room, um, they feel like they're in on something. Because yeah. I'm kind of saying stuff that maybe is not in the textbook a little bit. But at the end of the day, they've read the book. And I've snuck in the book a whole bunch of very big words. Um, like I must have mendacity in there 20 times. Um, <laughs> but, I, but I do it, I try to always do it so that in context the word makes sense. So Timmy would yell, you know, uh, lies, lies, mendacity or something. Um, so without realizing it, I've sort of engaged them on the appropriate, inappropriate level. Then I, I stick in those kind of big words that hopefully they learn, because that's how I learned. I learned the word, from reading Peanuts, I learned the word philosophy, theology, psychiatry, um, all of that. So, yeah, if, if you approach kids from that very, you know, is it appropriate, um, you'll bore the heck out of them. And if, if the point is I'm trying to get them to read the book, I can't have that voice. I have to have that, that borderline voice. That's just me. <laughs> well, Jared, I'd like you to address yeah, the no. same thing. And, and also, in your case, also how you chose the lunch lady yeah. uh, yeah. given, sure. you know, as a, as a title. Sure, and, and, and jumping off what Safan said, it's, it's just like, like there's no reason why Captain Underpants and Charlotte Webb can't like coexist in a child's reading life. Like there's absolutely no yeah. solid argument against that. Right. Uh, so, for, oh, so for the lunch lady books, you know, I was inspired by a chance encounter I had with my childhood lunch lady. I was an adult back in my old elementary school with my first book and there she was getting lunch ready and I said hi and she's telling me about her grandkids and I thought you leave school and have a life. I never thought about that before. Um, <laughs> and so I, I started uh, writing a, bu a book about the secret lives of lunch ladies and uh, inadvertently broke rules of publishing. Like there's a rule that like the book has to be about children. Well, she's like in her late forties and she's got a big old perm. And, and then like boys won't read books starring a girl protagonist. And I have parents coming up like, ah, oh, what a great boy book this is. And I'm like, you know, there's a 48 year old woman on the cover, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, and be, because I'm a big proponent of, you know, uh, getting girls to read books about boys and getting boys to read books about girls for whatever reason. When I was in seventh grade for my 
September book report, I, I did it on Anne of Green Gables. And because I was so, I was always obsessed with series. So like, yeah, I needed to know what happened to like Wolverine in the next issue. Yeah. But I needed to read Anne of Avonlea because what was going to happen next? You know? Um, and so whatever educator said, I'm going to just see, see, this, see if he's going to read this book too. You know? I mean, so you know, I, I don't think that we should also let our preconceived notions of what a kid's going to get excited about too to, to prevent us from, from trying to put a book in front of a reader. You know, it's great to have the two of you here because there is a gap in some ways I'm seeing, and I think we recognize it, between the writer and the appeal to the audience and the kids in a, a gut kind of way. And those of us more on the research or the academic or the book promotion side that also go along with some of the, what we think is the current research or what really seems to be the right thing. And uh, I think having a discussion and hearing you guys say exactly what you feel about how you title books and how you think about keeping your writing interesting enough to you, you know, to continue in this kind of specialized genre. Yeah, when, I, when I was uh, writing the first few Lunch Lady books, I actually went and reread all of the comics I wrote in fifth and sixth grade and wrote with that very direct language. Uh -huh. um, and and, and I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated by all of the statistics, too. I like, like the, especially with the psychology of it all. I, mean, I feel like, I mean, I didn't see a therapist as a teenager, but I guess I'm <laughs> dealing with that now in front of all of you. You know, mention was made about sticking big words into the books. It reminds me of the Lemony Snicket books. I don't remember. I uh, thought I'm sorry, they were the which book Lemony Snicket. Oh, I don't Snicket. remember what they were called. I found them very discouraged, and I always referred to them as the miserable kids. But <laughs> what, what, what was it? Series the, of unfortunate. Yeah, that's what it was. Yes. And yes. he would stick a word in, and then he'd go ahead and define it. And that happened just about on every page. So the children were reading the story, they're getting the vocabulary right. they're used to, but then they're learning new words. And he always defined it. And they loved the books. Yes. I thought they were discouraging, but it's not <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my yeah, I mean, like, I, I don't ever hold back from, from vocabulary, you know, um, in, in my picture books or in any of, any of my books. I mean, uh, Stefan, did you pick a word or two ahead of time that you wanted to make certain got into that book? Or? No, I just, I, again, I just do, st I think there's a whole series of um, uh, sort of insults, like late 19th century insults, like that Mark Twain used a lot, um, that I love to throw in the book, but right. not, not for any reason other than I find them funny. I think uh -huh. they sound funny. Right. Um, so, yeah, yeah. And I don't, you know, I think, uh, Stefan and I are, are like any, Cartoonists, like we are writing for our 11 year old selves. Absolutely. You know, we are writing to entertain ourselves, sure. and we're lucky enough that our mentality is that of a 10 year old kid. <laughs> and they like our books. Good. Thank you. Well, let's turn back to the audience. Uh, there's a hand in the very back, uh, sir. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Jerome Williams. I'm manager of theater programs at National Children's Museum at National Harbor, and um, you all talked about, you know, how, whether it was looking at comic book strips or, you know, just drawing helped to inspire you to write and learn to read, and for me, it was, it was acting, you know, and um, really Disney movies, that was kind of my age of growing up, I would, you know, watch those Disney movies over and over and over and over again until I learned all the lines, learned all the songs, and then it made me want to read plays, and then to know plays, and you know, study those things. And I think it's safe to say for most of the people in this room that the arts really help to make us who we are. And now you're seeing in a lot of schools where the arts are being taken out or being halfway cut out of a lot of programs. And I'm just curious to see what your take is on um, the connection between the arts and reading and then, you know, also specifically theater as well because that's the, you know, program that I run. So I'm just, just curious to see what your viewpoint is on that. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't be a reader if it weren't for comic strips and comic books. Um, or, for instance, I read the novelization of the 1989 Batman movie like six times, <laughs> you know? Uh, and and I, I just, I've always loved characters, and I would take characters any way I could get them. And, and for, unfortunately, a lot of those characters would go back to the, the printed word, you know, whether it was like, I would, I love the Smurfs, so then I would read Smurf books, you know? And, uh, and, and all of these different medias can, they all can coexist. 
Uh, then it's all about trying to, how, how do you balance that in a child's life? Like how do you limit the various screen times? But, um, but for me, all of those kind of visual mediums supported my excitement to read. Yeah, same thing. I, I don't know why we have a prejudice against a book if it has um, drawings, you know, like it has words. I mean, why does that matter? I've never drawn that distinction, you know? What, why is it any less good because half of the page has drawings and the other half is words? Yeah. They're reading, they're engaged, they learn plot, they learn arc, they learn character development, right? Yeah, I mean, and especially with picture books, because then they can, that, you know, they, what, I don't know what that word is, but you can look at the illustrations yeah, for context yeah, exactly. clues, mm -hmm. you know, and, and that, and they, they really do support each other. And especially, you know, I, I, I tell uh, students and, and educators, like, you know, a book with, an il with illustrations, you need to read the pictures, too. Because if you're not reading the pictures, you're, you're missing a part of the story. Right. Claire, or any on this side? <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right, Trudy, anything? Uh, you know, I think music as well is another one that's data suggests that kids exposed to music as well as yeah, art yeah. do better. Their brain development yeah. is enhanced, so I think you're absolutely on yeah. target you know, there. I and it's very sad that this, you know, budgets are being cut on all that. When you said fill your daughter's room with books, I was thinking books and music. You've yeah. got to have music. Yeah, yeah, when we have instruments. Yeah. And, and yeah. also, and, and not just in the bedroom, but in, in as many rooms as in they can, and where room. they can reach them. Yeah. You know, sometimes yeah. you see like this beautiful baby room and like the, the, the bookshelf is like up there. Yeah. Yeah. No, no. yeah. You, know? you know, I used, this is horrible, but when my son was younger, he loved the book, um, music. And he had loads of CDs, adult CDs or cassette tapes or whatever. And I would take him away, and that would be my punishment. I wanted him to behave, take away his music. Yeah. You know? And isn't that like, so painful, though? Yeah. We're not, yeah if you don't feel we're not going to have a story for bedtime, we're like, oh, please, <laughs> come through. I think uh, Mickey is next. Uh, wait for the mic. Yeah, thank you. I'm Nikki Freeney. I'm the coordinator of early childhood services for the District of Columbia Public Library. And you've talked a lot about reluctant readers who have learning disabilities, but that huge percentage of children that don't read are also children who are proficient readers. Mm -hmm. So could you comment about those readers who, and I think a lot of it is about choice, mm -hmm. but anything else you might comment about, it's not just children who have difficulties mm -hmm. who aren't reading yeah. for pleasure, it's proficient readers. I think it occurs, it's likely to occur in with children in, who come from homes where it's not being modeled, where reading isn't something that you just do. It was, it was mentioned earlier. I think when children see reading as a part of everyday life, um, they're more likely to do it and less likely to give in to peer pressure of reading is not cool, you know, for, especially for boys, reading is not cool, you need to be into sports. So I think, ha the reluctant readers who are proficient readers are more than likely not seeing, seeing it being modeled at home and being reinforced. And they're thinking that, you know, it's not cool. There's, there are other things that they should be doing to help them fit in with their peers. So I think the home situation is a big part of it. Yeah, I mean, if I saw go back to modeling, I would imagine that yeah. this is something that it's, it's not a homework assignment. You're reading for pleasure because mm -hmm. it's fun and it, you're mm -hmm. awesome and you can have a great story and great character. Yeah, just reading a lot. Reading aloud as well with kids, I think, and giving them the choice. And, you know, whoever the parent is that has a great voice, just use that voice. Get silly with reading. I think mm -hmm. there's a seriousness to things that sometimes I think is, mm -hmm. you know, which your books bring that levity to, to um, you know, reading. And I think that's the other thing. People get sort of stuck in those reluctant readers. So, you know, that message of reading can be fun, and, and it's, it's a great thing to do. And, and we're going to read aloud together, and I'm going to read it past. I'm going to get the silliest voice possible, yeah. you know, so that can model for the child. I think that may be helpful as well. And I'm sure many libraries do already, but maybe having workshops sure for parents, yes. right? That's, this is how you can be an engaging reader, mm -hmm. you know, because if, if the parent isn't into it yes. and excited, it's... Yes. Kind of, it's going to pass on, right? My husband could do any voice, so it was always the two-year-old was, Daddy, read. I mean, like, come on, homework. I'm, I'm so passionate about reading. I love reading. And the book would come out of my hand and into my husband's hand because he could do Dr. Zeus and he could do the Lorax, and that voice is still part of our family culture. My husband still has to repeat that voice because that was so important to the boys, and we talk about how we read together. So re sort of creating those family memories that you'll have with your kids and you have with your kids, I think is what we want to view upon, at least for me, my patients. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We're going to take one here and then we'll go to the other side. Uh, but thank you, please. Mm -hmm. um, 
I am, I'm just, I'm Erica Spencer, I'm a librarian here, but um, I have a 10 year old and I'm just, while I have you guys here, and I don't mean to pit you against each other, but my son is a huge fan of Stefan, of Pearls Before Swine and Timmy Failure, and probably very soon the lunch lady. Um, oh, and he, <laughs> that's where they fight. <laughs> but he um, gets in trouble. You know, they're talking about arts in the schools, and, and that's wonderful, and I'm a huge advocate of art in general, but he, he just gets in trouble for drawing cartoons in the back, and he's not a struggling reader. He's a voracious reader who reads. He, read, he finished Harry Potter before me, and he's only 10, so the whole series. He reads my parenting manuals and just, you know, <laughs> laughs Pants about them. Annoying, I mean, everything. Right? He, he reads <laughs> like crazy. He's not struggling. He's very smart. But he, he feels a disconnect at school. And just yesterday is a perfect example. Poetry slam at school. He wrote a great poem. It was like words in my head. I'm dizzy, whatever. It, but it was, it was deemed inappropriate because it was too cynical. Just like you talking about Lemony Snicket. It was too negative. Alex, write something positive. Do something. Let's write something nice about your vacation and wherever you know. And he doesn't want to write that. He wants to write something negative. And this is why he loves pearls before swine because he loves rap. He loves it. And he he sees the absurdities of life and the ironies and Timmy failure and you know the things that just don't go right. And but it's not encouraged in schools because it's so down and it's so it's so cynical. And and he's very sarcastic and he is like. He's 11, but he's, sometimes he's like an adult or a teenager or I don't know what. But how do we encourage? Because I, I love his teacher this year, but she says, you know, Alex, if you could just you know, put this into something constructive. But he writes at home. And the stuff he writes at home, I say, please do not bring that to school. Don't bring that to school. Whatever you do. I'm not kidding. I schooled him. I'm like, Alex, I don't want to see that at school. I don't want your teachers. You know, because it's so negative. So how do we combine these things so that he sees school as a place where he can write his comics and be encouraged and think, hey, you might be a graphic novelist someday, Alex. No, he's told, like, you need to focus on your work. So how do we put these things together so that, you know... Well, I, I would tell your teacher, tell his teacher, that, you know, my son is going to grow up to be a very famous author-illustrator. <laughs> and he is going to des design a despicable, terrible, terrible character based on you. <laughs> for not to, Because that's what we do. I mean, that's really how we, it takes a couple of decades to get that revenge, but that is what happens. Should we call her now? And, why are you being such a... <laughs> Hope she doesn't watch this. Hi, Mrs. That's <laughs> why well, you didn't give your name. <laughs> I, I was very lucky that I, I grew up with very supportive educators. And when I was in the ninth grade, I, I, and I was always fairly well behaved, he worked fairly. Um, <laughs> in ninth grade, I, 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 I would make friends at the new high school by drawing funny pictures of my teachers. Like, they were never obscene, um, but they were just funny little drawings of them. And, and in ninth grade English class, my friend laughed a little bit too loud. and. Mr. Greenwood spun on a dime, saw that it was me, and kicked me out of the classroom. And, and I'm, I'm sweating out in the hallway. And he came out and he said, let me see the note. And, and, and I had to give him the drawing. And he looked at it and he said, you're very talented. <laughs> um, and he, he said, just stop, stop drawing in my classroom. And he connected me to the person who ran the school newspaper. Then I was hired to be the cartoonist for the high school newspaper. So he could have had made a very different decision that would have very negatively impacted my life. Uh, and I, I spoke of this on a TED talk that I gave that's it's been viewed a, a bunch of times. So uh, why don't you maybe share that link passive aggressively <laughs> to your teacher? Okay, we need to, we're gonna go back here. We're gonna need to get some of the, I saw a couple of hands way in the back. There we go, thank you. Hi, my name is uh, Catherine Marsh and I'm a children's book author. Um, I'm also the parent of a kindergartner in the D.C. public schools, um, and um, I am interested in talking with you guys because um, my son is basically a reluctant reader. He's, you know, in the lowest reading group in his kindergarten class. And he, in my house, um, contrary to what you were saying, you can't go very far without tripping over a book or hitting your head on a book or turning around and seeing a book. Um, and we, you know, that's all we do is we read and we talk about books and I'm always testing plots on him, etc. Um, but one of the things that I've noticed, interestingly, is a lot of my friends who have children at private schools, their children are not really being pushed to read yet. In fact, there's really no, 
It's very play-based. Um, it's not, kindergarten has become much, much, much more academic. And it was interesting, was when my son was getting ready to start kindergarten and had some anxiety about it, we actually found an old Mr. Rogers, which we watched about what it was like to go to kindergarten. And he watched it and he felt better and he saw he's gonna learn you know, letters and stuff like that. And then he got there and it turned out that's not what kindergarten was like at all because no. now it's very academic and it's all about learning to read and it's all about taking tests and things like that. Um, and I think this relates back a little bit to what this woman was saying here about testing. Um, but my question for you is, you know, are, are we being developmentally appropriate with children and how we're teaching them to read, especially children of that age? Because, again, my son has been, they've given him tests. He does not have a learning disability. He comes from a family where his father is a, you know, reporter. His mother is a children's book author. Um, he has been exposed to books you know, since day one. Um, and yet he just, like a lot of boys that I see in his class, are just not ready to sit down and do some of the, um, the academic skills that reading involves. So my question for you is, you know, getting back, I guess, a little bit to the testing question, but, you know, can we talk a little bit about how we're teaching children to read and how to be developmentally appropriate about that, especially with boys? Is he too in the SOL testing program? <laughs> <laughs> You're looking at me. I don't think I should be the one to answer that question because I don't think what happens in early grades is developmentally appropriate. I think a lot of what kids are being asked to do in the kindergarten and first grade, they're not ready for. So I'm not the one <laughs> to ask that, you know. Yeah, I mean, I would tend to agree as well. I think it's, it's very sad, and I think yeah. that's, you know, I, I, we're, you know, teaching to the test is what we're all struggling with and you know when you have a child like yours who's going to be a late bloomer the, I mean their temperament each child has a different temperament mm -hmm. you have to keep that in mind um, mm -hmm. you know they're, they're, they're slow to warm up kids there's kids who take their time and it is a very disappointing I think and we're, we're all struggling with this because we are mm -hmm. shifting in this culture and you know and unfortunately some of that then leads some parents to just get too focused on the colors and the numbers and that's really not what it's about either and I you know I think it's um, yeah, I don't know how to change this yet, I, I, I have to be honest with you, um, but I think a conversation has to keep going on this. I mean, my own son was the same way. He was exactly what he grew up in a house full of books. He was in the lowest reading group until he was in third grade, and, you know, now he's doing, he loves books. So he's you great. say he started in third in the lowest, grade? He started in the lowest reading group <coughs> lowest until grade. Th third okay. grade. Until was, the third grade. He was having the same, he was just not ready to sit still. He was very reluctant, you but, know. So. I said the culture of, of numbers, and it's so sad. I mean, Stefan and I visit lots of schools, and there's no way to assign a number to what like that student gets out of that afterwards. And when I was in the third grade, an author visited our school and, and offhandedly paid me a compliment on my drawing, and, and, and that had a profound effect on me. Um, yeah, no, I feel the same. I'm, it's so cool. You know, that's the best thing about what we get to do. When you go to a school and there's at least one kid in every class who, he's usually the one who comes up to you at the very end of the signing. He waits for everyone to be done. Aww. And then he has these questions that are asked very quietly, but very earnestly. And so I talk to him as I would another adult. And I say, hey, you know, how much do you draw a day? And what do you do? And, and uh, I know by the end of it, I've reached that kid. And that's such a great thing, because I don't, I don't know if I had that when I was a kid. I think that prejudice that you talk about, you know, about drawing and all that, you know, something's wrong with it or something. But I don't know. You know, it's funny. I was going to say when you, when you asked that question, I wonder sometimes when I look back on high school and we wonder why people don't read as adults. Um, I mean, I had great English teachers, 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th grade, but, man, they kick all the fun out of reading. I mean, you get the scarlet letter, and that's bad enough, but, but then you have to analyze all the different layers of symbolism and the color symbolism and the character. By the time it's over, that's a geometry assignment. I mean, it's terrible. <laughs> so I remember while all that was going on when I was about 16, somebody handed me, um, it was Kurt Vonnegut's Breakfast of Champions, and it had drawings in it, little sketches, and he didn't take himself seriously. And it was great. And I said, wow, books can do this. They don't have to be all heavy and serious. And they could be fun. Um, so yeah, I wonder that sometimes. Maybe that's not fair to my English teachers. But man, you associate it with this heaviness and unfun. And it shouldn't be that way. Yeah. I don't know. That's just me. Okay. No, it's all of us, actually. <laughs> we'll go out here to the audience. This lady, yes. My name is 
Sidi Ching. I teach at the University of Maryland. Um, you're talking about books in the home and books everywhere, and it's made me think, what about the homeless shelters? Do you know of any programs that are trying to put books in these shelters where kids are spending so I much yeah. time? I have one over here. I think every city is trying to do that, so please, go ahead. Oh, okay. I'll wait for the microphone. <laughs> Hi there, I am Eileen Hanning and I'm the Education Specialist with The Reading Connection. Jarrett is an old dear friend um, who has supported us. We, for 25 years, have been reading aloud with children in homeless shelters in D.C. and Virginia. We're going to Maryland next year, or in the fall. We provide uh, grown-ups who sit and read and talk with the kids about books. It's all about the fun and the pleasure. There's none of the phonics. There's no testing. There are no quizzes. It's about coming in, having an experience with the books and the other kids, having um, hearing stories read aloud, all that language input. Um, we don't make the kids read. We're reading to them. We um, have activities related to the theme that they're reading about. The kids get to choose books to take home with them or take back to their room, or whatever it works. Uh, homeless shelters, domestic violence safe houses, transitional housing, affordable housing. And it's all about helping families create home environments mm -hmm. that support reading and creating that love of the experience so that then they're willing to fight the good fight to, to break the code and learn to read themselves. What organization are you The Reading Connection. We have a fabulous website. <laughs> <laughs> And Go ahead and give us your website. Um, the www.thereadingconnection.org, all one word. And we also do parent workshops, as Jarrett knows, where we work with parents and help them build their confidence and learn about sharing books with their kids and um, providing them with books to, to read with their kids. We work with professionals. We train teachers, lit, uh, social workers, um, par our partner agencies, and then we also have a book club program where we mail books into the homes of families at no cost. So we, it's there, Edie. It's, it's happening. Uh, I'll take the question in the very back of the room on that side. We have about five more minutes, and so let's keep the question short and the answer short, and let's see how many we can squeeze in. My name is Barbara Pitkin, and I work for Prince George's County Public Schools as a media specialist. And I want to know, how do we reach out to our parents and get them to become readers and not always resort to technology? Because a lot of the schools are moving towards getting the iPads or the Chromebooks and the kids are reading via technology, but not holding and getting that tactile feel of a book. Yes. So when you have parents who come in who are reluctant readers, their first thing is, oh, I'll give them the iPad. They can read the story on the iPad. So how do I reach my parents and tell them, you still need to have that piece of paper in your hand that you can feel and bunny ear the paper, turn back, come back to it? Because you can't do that on a computer. I, I would say use the computer to get that message to them. I mean, if you, if you don't already have a Facebook page for your, your library or Twitter, create one and then put content out there and encourage them to, because your parents are all on, on Facebook. You know, and then that way you'll get the information as they're like, oh, maybe I'm, oh, am I supposed to be on something else than this? <laughs> okay. oh, Thank you. Thank you. Here's a question in the back row on this side, please. Yeah. There, yes. Hi, thanks for being here today. Uh, my name is Beth Decker, and I am an elementary school librarian in Arlington County. And I wanted to talk, go back to what the DC public librarian was mentioning is the reluctant reader who's also a proficient reader. I have two daughters, one's 13 and one's nine. They were both raised in the same home by a librarian mother. The 13-year-old reads, reads, reads. The nine-year-old, although she is a good reader, she scores very high on her reading SOL tests or whatever, um, she can read, she can comprehend, she can talk to me when I make her about books, but she doesn't find pleasure in reading. Is that something we should be worried about? She finds pleasure in other things and not reading even though she can read. Is that a re reluctant reader that we should be concerned about? I wouldn't think so. Um, I think I'd be more concerned if she was a reluctant reader who couldn't read, because we all have preferences. So I probably, I mean, someone else may have a different opinion, but I wouldn't worry about that. I, would, yeah, I okay. wouldn't either. I think that's exactly, I mean, that's my younger son, and he's 
doing, you know, he loves to read now. He's actually the more voracious reader now of all of us. So, I, you know, I think it's just a developmental phase that kids go yeah. through. It may be some of the things, you may have not find the right topic, the right author. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. You know, I think those are the things that develop over time, figuring out what your tastes are in, in reading, whether you like fiction, nonfiction. I mean, there's a lot of things that go into that decision to, to sort of pick up that book. And, you know, I think you're doing all the right things. You're modeling, you're, you have the books available, and, 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 and over time it'll come. I mean, I, I don't worry about that. I would agree with you totally. You know, if there, there's a deficit there, then that's a very different story. And we need to think about, you know, she, can she see okay? Does she, I mean, mm -hmm. you know, I'm being silly here, but I, that's what I'm, I would say, sort of, you know, I wouldn't be worried. Okay, we're going to do three more questions, and one is right here in the front. Yes, right there. Hi, I'm Ellie Cantor. I'm part of Turning the Page, and we actually engage families to support their children's education and development and in D.C. public schools. And my question was really about, I feel like we've been hitting on some tension between sort of a resistance to accept comics or graphic novels, and one of the questions that come up with the families that we work with is if their children are reading on the computer or, you know, reading books in that format, I know that that kind of takes away their, the tactile experience of holding a book, but do you sort of advise against that type of reading? Because I, I don't. I guess is there a hierarchy now between sort of the digital reading experience versus I the paper? Know. Anyone who wants to tackle that? I, I can. I can jump in on this. I, I received a tweet one night of a of a parent, and it, and they said, "Oh, my, my my son is a reluctant reader, but I gave him a, I gave him a lunch lady book, and, and and here's a picture of him reading." And I opened the picture, and it was like this beautiful, serene. Um, you know, fireplace and the child is holding a, a rectangle that was glowing like garishly. And I went to bed thinking like, oh, you know, well, it's great that he's reading, but you know, he's on the screen. And, and then I, and I, woke, I woke the next day and there was another tweet that said well, he liked it so much, he instantly downloaded the second book and read that too. And I instantly thought, oh, I was judging his reading life as adults were reading, judging my reading life when I was a kid too. So I guess at the end of the day, you know, reading is reading is reading is reading. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think that's kind of true. I would say that too. I think the younger infants, though, and the younger children really need that tactile experience because we know that oral motor is a very important step in their development. So I would say, you know, for kids under three, four, I'm not so cre crazy about it. But the older kids, I think they're reading. That's exactly right. I mean, you're opening up another world. You're you're supervising it again. It's not the the mindless video. I mean, they're reading. Oh, can I say one huge advantage of that electronic way that I have found? Um, I, you know they have that function now on the Kindle, when you don't understand a word, you touch it, and the oh, definition yeah, appears. I, I mean, my whole life I've read yeah. books, seeing words I don't understand, and thinking like I know you all do. I'll go to the dictionary and look that up. You never go to the dictionary <laughs> right. and look it up. But when you can just touch it and the definition is there, I've learned more words in the last couple years of my life than ever. That's a great that's thing. Good. That's great. That is incredible. Right. Uh, I'm going to take uh, one here in front, I think. Well, all right, let's have her. Okay, thank you. Hi, my name is Sushmita, and I might be the only artist in this room, but I just want to say my daughter, uh, and I see a pattern here, the second child is probably less interested in books as the first child. Mm -hmm. And I, my daughter is like that. But I wanted to say how she loves the fact that graphic novels are in a series. And she reads Baby Mouse, and she says, I'm not sure I like it, but I finished four. And so <laughs> <laughs> she goes back to library in school, she can tell her librarian, OK, I need the fifth book. And so she feels like she is able to read more and more of that. The second thing is I do a lot of um, literacy work with children and art. And when they make pictures, I make them find, put all those details in their writing. So I just recently did one, and the girl had her picture of her room, was everything was orange. And I said, is orange the only color pencil you had? And she said, no, it's my favorite color. My bookshelf is orange, my cat is orange, my bed cover is orange. <laughs> and so I told her, put all that in your writing. And she did. So I think art um, shouldn't be like a different block of time from English or reading. And I think there should be ways in which they can be connected. So I don't know what your thoughts are about And art not just in, in connecting to, but also just for the child's spirit, too. I mean, uh, art, art can help a child get through those difficult, challenging times and, and expressing themselves in, in such a profound way. Mm -hmm. Like I said, two more questions. One here <laughs> and the one over here, and that'll be it. Hi, I'm Anita Marina from, um, I run the Read Across America program for NEA. Um, two things. 
One, I just did a, an article that'll be in the summer at Chevenier today on turning teens on to reading, which uh, some tips, and one of which included graphic novels, because they're just awesome, and they're different, it's just different entry points, as yeah. one of my um, graphic novel um, illustrators said. But the other thing I wanted to also talk about for, for those of you is to say, it's, is to see whether or not, I'm involved with the We Need Diverse Books um, effort, and so that's really wonderful. And so I, I wonder if you're seeing books with different, um, by diverse authors with different characters so that kids see themselves. I, I had a number of authors at a panel talk about finding themselves finally in a book and that turned them on. It turned them into writers and illustrators. So I know for all of you how you feel about that because there's this wonderful groundswell in our students are more and more diverse and there's a real need to have that. Any comments from the panel? No, I, mean, I agree with that yeah. wholeheartedly. Yeah, I think we yeah, agree. Yeah. And and certainly for Reach Out and Read, we look at when we order books, you know, we have to order thousands and thousands of books. We make sure we have a population that matches, that we have. And we have our doctors look at the books and the patients say, you know, is this something you'd be interested in looking at and having our kids be part of? you know, so that the content is appropriate as well. Yeah. It's very yeah. important to be respectful. We also have books in like 12 different languages and bilingual and so, you know, that's all very important to make sure you're meeting the patient where they're at. Yeah, all, all of our children need to be able to see themselves as the hero in the yes, story. Yes, Yeah. Okay, final question. My, my, excuse me, my name is Sally Fassman. I am a newly minted volunteer at the Young Leaders Center, but I am a retired teacher. I taught preschool special ed for many years, and one of the things we did with the four-year-olds was have them act out stories mm -hmm. that they're reading. So they'd act out the three little pigs and the three billy goats gruff and caps for sale. And the kids loved it. Mm -hmm. And you know, they, at that age, most of them can't read, but they were very involved with the books, and they loved the books and say, can we act it? Can we do it? I want to be this person, and I want to be that person. And, and it got them involved. <laughs> Um, and to tag on to that, there is an article in the New York Times, I believe it was on Sunday, about the lack of teaching cursive in school. And there is research, research to show that it really helped in writing, and, excuse me, in, in reading and in creativity. And I have a question for Stefan and Jared. If you had iPads instead of paper, do you think you would have been as interested in cartooning? as you are, would that have made a difference? Yeah, we would have been able to read way more cartoons than we had access to. <laughs> and we'd probably be making cartoons on our iPad. <laughs> That's true, yeah. yeah. No, I mean, I think in iPad, I mean, there's, there are, are programs that you are just a consumer of, and there are ones that you can create on. And, and sometimes you could, you could look at it just as a tool to create and a, a, a tool to read versus something that, you know, takes a lot of, um, you know, self-restraint to not be like, I'm gonna, play with some angry birds or something. But, yeah. Know, what, do you, what do you think? What, what do you think life would be like for you if you had that? Yeah, that's true. I have noticed that with um, the iPad, like if I read on it, I am tempted to turn to a game now and then. Yeah. <laughs> so it is a little bit, it is a little, there are, you know, good things and bad things about it. So, yeah, I don't know. That's a good point. I don't know. Okay. Stefan had the last word. I want to uh, thank, and actually it's appropriate, Sally asked the last question from the Young Reader Center because I also want to acknowledge the help of the Young Reader Center and Karen in uh, organizing this, but in particular, I'd like you to join me with the final round of applause for Trudy, Claire, Jarrett, and Stefan for a wonderful job. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.